an erection. A huge... Get out of my face. If there's one truth in the cosmos, one cosmic truth, the truth is... And get out of my face. Get out of my fucking face. Invitation, but after watching some of your YouTube video... I don't think I would fit into the swimming pool very well. Hmm. wonder why he says that. Again, thanks for the invitation and good luck in your creative endeavors. Sincerely, Michael Aquino. Oh, not every day you uh, get a letter from Michael Aquino. Uh, yeah. Oh, all right. How you doing? Anthropos here with another exciting episode of You Don't Know. You don't know, huh? So don't act like you do. The 
Hey, man, thanks for taking time out to talk to me today. Sure. All right, man. Oh, what did I do with this? <laughs> and so, uh, we're doing a we're doing a bottle deal today instead of a, a can. Oh, welcome! I did wrong. <laughs> welcome to another exciting episode of You Don't Know. You don't know, huh? So don't act like you do. Back by popular demand in the studio today from the East Coast, we have America's original super soldier, John Storm. John, are you with me? Yes, I am. All right, man. Man, you're you're looking spry today, and and uh, it looks like you're in a good mood. Oh, I'm well, definitely in a in a good mood. Spry. Yeah, I've been a lot sprier. <laughs> So. And the thing that interests me most about, I, I got some friends in Peru and that, and they're talking about the Nordicos in the kind of hollow mountains. We had something similar in Sh uh, uh, allegedly in Mount Shasta. Actually, I'm, I have less reason to doubt them now than I ever had, but they're not there anymore. But they talk about these tall people that they, just like me, but they speak just about any language and I had a lot of exposure with a lot of different languages and had to basically as I was being used by uh, MK Ultra, CIA, you know, our government. Uh, I'm seeing a lot of pieces all come together and it's a, a message of hope I give to everybody whose life has been fragmented up by these damn programs. Eventually, I find over the years that the pieces do come together. You see more and more things that make things you're gonna you find hard to believe. Is this real, or am I just fucked up in the head? It's kind of like, look, I've had the brightest and evilest minds of the 20th century: Dr. George Estabrooks, Dr. Sidney Gottlieb, Dr. Ewan Cameron, Dr. Julian West. I can I can go on and on, and and, and every one of them is documentable. Uh, uh, even with other clinics and other sites, because you, as I've said, MK Ultra was an umbrella for over 150 different projects, and that was when this semi-toothless old geezer was a little bitty boy. Okay, you you have met you've met Dr. Ewan Cameron. I've met all of them at some point or another because I was a prodigy. I was just across the lake from him in Rochester, New York. Wow. By the time I was 10 years old, I had written two composition books of uh, music. One of, one of my pieces, they used to back then take the public school kids and stuff in buses to the Eastman School of Music, very famous place. At the Rochester Philharmonic would give us, um, Grandma insisted I have a classical education. And I mean really classical. Her generation was born in the Victorian era. All right. So this is where kind of I come from or the kind of mindset you kind of get from me comes from. So at one point I've written something that they liked so much. Dr. Paul, Way I can name names that I, the exact dates in that played it before all of the schools that come up that Tuesday before everybody with the Rochester Philharmonic, they played my pieces. Then after wow. that, my two notebooks disappeared, and I never wrote music again. I was disgusted. Then I did painting, and then I was, you know, and it's like they would march me around to these little civic things where lots of people with German names and the sonic rings and, and the pillars of the community would look at this lovely little pretty blonde boy in the middle of a, it wasn't all black, but it was, you know, Whites were the minority in the schools in the areas that I was literally forced to grow up in. All right. You're allowed to go so far and no further. It, 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 the world was very different before they had the riots in 1964 there in Rochester. Uh, uh, and and d looking back, do you think that that was maybe by design to be uh, raised around all those children to give you more of a, a, a cultural, uh, you know? Yeah, you have to understand that exactly the people who, who were my pediatricians from the time I was born were exactly the people that were running those concentration camps in their human experiments on those people in Auschwitz and that everybody keeps trying to tell us, oh, remember and feel sorry for those people. And it's like, yeah, they're dead. I'm here and you just piss on me. 
Absolutely. It's, you know, re it's reprehensible. They come here and brought it here, and, you, you know, it's kind of like, I get a little upset. And it's not that I don't feel bad for those others. I know what you've been through. I've seen all my peers die and worse from what they've done to, uh, uh, um, yes. to them. And it's like, man, who will believe? It, it, well, it's, it's, as if, it, it's as if recognizing that the same thing went on, on over here somehow takes away from that over there, you know, and, and may, maybe only in the minds of the, you know, the, 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 the narrative of the controllers, that's, but that's it, you know. That's it, yeah, that's it. Controllers and handlers. And over the years, I've learned it's in my best interest when somebody's trying to sell me something, not to be hungry. You know, <laughs> don't be hungry. Don't be quick for the sale. If there's something you really, really need, let you be looking for it when you happen upon them and then consider it, you know, but otherwise don't be hungry. Man, I, that, that really applies to my uh, situation today because I was out looking for a, a, a uh, something that I that I do need. You know, it's a high a high mm -hmm. ticket item that we all kind of can't live without. And mm -hmm. but yeah, I decided to you know stay back a little bit. You know, and uh, and you know they've already you know wanted to come down on the price and stuff. So I'm just yeah, I'm just gonna ride this a little bit. Then you know, I yeah. look them up mm -hmm. tomorrow. Sleep on yeah, it. It's not yeah. It's not like you shut yourself off in a can away from the world or anything. It's like you just kind of sit back. When I am hungry, maybe I want to consider this. Maybe this is a good clue that that's not the kind of restaurant I want to go to. Right. <laughs> right. You know, and more often than not, actually, almost always with our government. Never want to go to that restaurant. No, no, no. Uh, uh absolutely not. And even in this, uh, this genre that we're in, you know, that uh, I, you know, I like to tell people I'm in the Earth Mysteries genre. I kind of created my own. But the truth is, I get thrown in this larger thing that that can just it can be maybe called the conspiracy genre or something like that. And yeah, uh, there's, they try. There's see. There is conspiracy from one end to the other, undoubtedly. I don't care who you, you, you call it history, you call it politics, but if you just read the words exactly as they're written, it is conspiracy. Theory, no. The theory is how this or that got done or who exactly was involved with it or so and so. You know, that's the part of the speculation, the fact that it happened. You know, these physical effects were noted, you know, uh, uh, by everybody who saw it, or m at least most of the people who saw it. Uh, uh, then you know, well, okay, this reality definitely exists. I always have to double check everything, I think, because I came through those programs. I remember the chair. I remember the hypnosis. I, re I even remember Dr. Estabrooks. The, the, you know, the more I think about it, easy just just trying to calm me down about the little episode with the little Martians coming and shoving a triangular thingy up my nose, which made my nose bleed really bad the next morning. But, you know, it was in my imagination, my boyish genius imagination. And right. who could doubt I didn't have one? And I'd, I just ran with it, you know, uh, uh, as a boy all my life. But it was real. Oh, yeah. And it's like, I'm only now discovering that, and it's kind of like how much of that other stuff was my imagination, you know, just a dream or just a fancy that I, you know, I enjoyed it. I learned something from it, but, but then, you know, 2014, the MRIs come back. This is real, and there's more besides, a lot more. The, 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 the stuff from Ultra, I knew about. I remembered, but what could they do? I've seen most of their technical stuff. It's not that impressive. They might have something in here that has a basically it's a file number you can pick up by reading it. So all it is is a number. The number itself don't tell you shit. It tells you the number of a specific file somebody has somewhere that has a whole bunch of information. The information itself back then would not be on the chip. Just the file number, right? It would be locked you know? in, locked in uh, some Jesuit's basement in their high, in their house or something, you know, or a Swiss bank account right. or, mm -hmm. or things like that. If you've been in a number of these programs, you know, there's ways you have to get finances or be able. Your backup is all kinds of different ways of, you know, having more. You never go any place or into anything, not just a building, not even into a country or a city, without knowing more than one way out. All right, you got it, and and that that's another apropos thing you're telling me because I'm uh, just I'm planning a trip to Bolivia 
now. And so probably uh, in about a, a month and a half, I'll be down there. And so I want to be, you know, I'm going to take your advice and, and come up with an exit strategy. Oh, yeah. And, and another thing, if you don't want to draw attention, don't look like you're watching everybody. You know, you know, when, you, when you're walking down the street, if the sun or a light's at your back, notice the shadows that get close to you, but don't go twitching over your shoulder to see until you do see a shadow stretching towards you. You know, look for shiny things, windows, glass, chrome, anything that shows a reflection of anybody moving up close behind you or, you know, or, or around you out of your peripheral vision. But if you jerk around and you look, you look to the, to the predators and, and those actually hunting spies, you look like a man with something to hide, something he wants to keep, something they might want to see or have for themselves. And you're just, you might as well, you know, write a sign on your back saying, come and get it, I'm loaded. But this is what the, this was the basis between behind the whole 1950s, early 50s when they pulled me in, the trauma-based mind control for a super soldier as such. Because what they did is they constantly had us in anxiety for our lives. If I don't get straight A's this year in school, I will end up in that institution. And you got that institution is the, the Terrence Tower, like I said, is one you can look up and that is it's a psychiatric monstrosity uh uh we knew what happened we you know uh, uh uh if you don't do this this is going to snap down and cut your fingers off this electricity is going to kill you this is these drugs that they're doing all cut you were, there was always some challenge to your life or your existence that you were trying to figure out or wind your way through however you could didn't always you know i'm sick why well now i know why i'm taking this this chemo uh uh but uh then you you don't know what the hell is going on and you're just constantly dealing but you're constantly we're quick i mean you, kids are very nervous in fact you see a lot of kids like that there's a good candidate for ultra and maybe for their own sake Watch them extra hard because who's handling them or, or going to handle them if they notice. Uh, 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 but uh, the adrenaline, it was like uh, my doctor, my, my pediatrician used to tell my mom and my grandma that it was like my adrenaline switch was stuck on full. You know, he's having these problems. It's nerves. He's very high strung. At, uh, 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 it's like his adrenaline switch is stuck on full all the time. And it's kind of like if I wasn't scared. Then as I'm playing, I'm like bouncing off the walls. And in my case, literally up and across the walls. Uh, um, uh, I loved hang time. <laughs> and I had the kind of resilience to, you know, uh, grandma bought me this, this uh, Superman suit costume when I was like two. And uh, I went bounding off the back of the couch to, you know, go flying in it, you know, head first into the corner of a coffee table, you know, glass one yet, wiped it out. I had this little scar right over here still from it, but it's, it was a small thing, just up and recovered from it. But like there was something that she got me, I was a year and a half when she got me home. So she had me like maybe six months and didn't quite expect everything that was going to happen quite like it did. But grandma was wise and clever and and a pretty decent healer because I was resilient. And mm -hmm. she, you know, the more you learn, the better it is. Don't stop learning. Don't stop gathering information. But don't just take information somebody gives you, even that I say at face value. It's like, look it up. That's a, it's kind of the nice thing about where I'm at. It's like, you can ask me anything. I can tell you. I can name you names. I can tell you the places. Uh, I haven't been in every place. But where I've been, I've been, and I and I know it's like, you know, what do you want? <laughs> you know, I'll tell you how they did it. See, the the premise the Nazis had was that old urban myth, myth and it really isn't that much of a myth. It's not like it doesn't happen all the time. Of the grandma pulling, picking up the pickup truck off of her grandson, you know, to save his life. So this is kind of the premise. So the idea that, all right, you have that strength. Well, sometimes these people do this and they suffer broken bones from their bones snapping because basically your muscles work by their torque on your bones. So, you know, martial artists for centuries have been 
smacking bricks and stuff, microfracturing their fists and their knuckles to develop them to be hard enough where they can smash through concrete and stuff without breaking their bones. So they decide we're going to microfracture from head to toe. At, uh, uh, and, and, and make you this way. If you survive it, we're going to do it. To, they did this to literally hundreds of p kids in my crèche, all right, uh, before or during they got to me. Uh, uh, they failed a lot of times, and, a lot, and it's not a pleasant thing. It is not a pleasant sensation. Uh, uh, uh. Well, let me tell you, uh, today's uh, people that are still subjected to uh, trauma-based mind control, you know, I know that may not be uh, MK Ultra, but it's, you know, maybe, let's just say MK Ultra style. But you know, it's, it's still, whether they're being made into a super soldier or not, it's one of those, back then there was 150, now all of them weren't making super soldiers. They were experimenting trying to get this, that, or the other thing that they could do with a super soldier or whatever they, they kind of had plans for. But the bone hardening and that, they were looking, in fact, the Nazi doctors in particular were already working all through World War II on trying to make a super soldier. Mm -hmm. And they got me at birth and a bunch of others, and they successfully made one out of me. Yeah. And a couple others that I knew about, that of my generation, all right, of that particular time period, the 50s and the early 60s. All right. Duncan comes around about the mid 60s when they're really getting serious with his handling at, uh, uh, you know, on the timeline. So we call them second generation, whether that's exactly technically true, according to their program outline. I really couldn't say, but I could tell you the differences. And, you know, if you know both of us, it becomes, you know, it, it's apparent some th things we have in common and things we have that's that, that's kind of just unique to ourselves and it's been that way with everybody they can't stamp you out of a cookie cutter if they do they limit you and you're just cannon fodder all right and why spend all that money on somebody you're just going to blow the fuck up <laughs> you know exactly yeah. uh, uh, us they spent a lot of money on to get there and they wasted a lot of good americans and they just allowed to waste them it's kind of like how many People, the gray aliens lied on the treaty and they took more, abducted more people than they said they would. Well, how many people were MK Ultra abducting? Right, yeah, blame it on the aliens. In my crash, my mom and grandma thought that I was going to the, you know, that thing to be put up for adoption. And who wouldn't, I mean, what fine set of parents, American parents in the early 1950s, wouldn't hesitate to take a blonde hair, blue eyed, bouncing baby white kid. You know, and I was, I had great features and I was adorable. It's disgusting, but. <laughs> yeah. See, I, I didn't, because of their conditioning, I didn't see me that way. I saw me as an unwanted damn thing. All right. That's how I, that was my self image. And the best thing I could do was become the best thing they were aiming at me. And if I failed, well, oh, I was going to be a vegetable or worse. Uh, uh, and, you know, this was my future. This is what I could see, you know, uh, for myself in this program growing up. Is it, it's very... Your survival depended on your ex achieving the excellence within the program. Right, right. Or, you know, worse would happen. Or you'd die trying. Even yeah. while, you know, that in itself could kill you and did many. Yeah. Uh, were, you, um, were you subjected to electroshock treatments? Lots, but not on the head. They wouldn't do the head because, well, as it turns out, I am loaded with implants. Uh, you know, they didn't want to ruin the mind because I'm also very kind of psychic. I pick up on things a lot before they happen. And, and uh, you know, this is things they want. They want you and they want that IQ. Well, they did that themselves in MK Ultra by the eidetic or photographic memory. The more you, more data you put in, well, you'd say your IQ is higher. Mm -hmm. The more information you have to work with, the bigger toolbox of possibilities mm -hmm. you have to work around you. This makes a survivable spy assassin agent. And right, stuff. right. They're not, yeah, they're they're not using you to like smuggle drugs across a border or whatever. You know, they're no. They that themselves. Actually, I went and killed the guys that got the drugs and was going to smuggle them across, and they took them and they smuggled them. They didn't even have to smuggle. They just put them in their CIA planes, and nobody was going to check shit at the airport and got it out onto American streets and testified about it later. And 
Jesus, why is them? Why are they free, walking about, breathing free air? You know? Who knows? Who knows? Let me tell you, John. I, uh, I there's a, an investigation that you know that, I've, that I'm not going to talk about, but that you know that I've been doing uh, involving a friend of mine who I suspect has had been uh, put to one of these programs. But I've had a young lady over here the last uh, two nights, and let me tell you, this person. We started talking, and she asked me if I'd ever heard of gang stalking. And um, I said, yeah, you know, and, and she, you know, that I, and she, because she knew I had a, a, a channel like this. But anyway, she, what her version of gang stalking was, was word for word. What I've had this show on here where there's a, a, a very, uh, she's one of my psychics, and her name is Tara. But, mm -hmm. and she, word, it was almost word for word. What, what she was saying about this gang stalking was like what Tara had been through. And instantly I realized this lady has, is one of these She's been brought, in other words, being abducted by police, uh, going in ambulances, going in different psych wards. Her name's, her name's Tara? No, uh, oh, well, uh, no, that, that happened to Tara, yeah, yeah, but this, this Tara, other lady. Tara, 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 Tara how old is she? Uh, Tara, Tara's probably 35 years old. She, she's had gone under several different names, but she's well known, but she's Tara Weston, is, is, uh, oh. she is now. Oh. Uh, yeah, I was thinking of another terror. It just just sounded very, very familiar. It, it, it could it could easily be the, the same one because this she, this uh, lady's very well known. She's been in the community for years, and she was she, terror, yeah, she, uh, she well she was a psychic. She was used for these psychic yeah. stuff. But uh, uh, this, uh, this one didn't really get that way till afterwards. And, uh, and then I, I haven't seen her in a long time, so I don't know how, how well she developed in that. But it, it was one of those cases where I kind of deflected. So she was going to end up in a really bad gang spot at, at one point, And I very I was proud of myself. I still am. So this is me bragging. All right. But I'm still not stretching the truth. I'm not. But I'm bragging. All right. I feel very proud of myself for what I did. There was this woman named Tara that. Uh, and uh, I knew her from work, all right, and she was the kind of gal. See, a lot of things about witchcraft and wizardry is pattern recognition. Sometimes it's not just a psychic thing. Sometimes it's seeing patterns in people's lives and the weather, things around you that kind of tell you something is brewing or, or what kind of thing might be brewing. And in her case, as she comes up and we're talking and 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 uh, we had a lot of good conversations because I wasn't the kind of geezer that was going to hit on her or anything like that. You know, she's, she's kind of like my daughter to me. You know, I kind of talk to her like that. And, and it's nice. Got a nice relationship with her. So I'm over her house one day to talk. And she's telling me about this new boyfriend. Well, she was telling me at work. And I got concerned. So I took an invitation to go over to her house and talk. All right. She's one of these gals that kind of like the bad boys. But she ends up with these testosterone filled idiots that think they look macho and big beating on her. So she gets beat up a lot, ends up in these relationships, gets abused and she ends up being a punching bag. And, uh, and my heart just breaks for her. And it's like, you can't be there delivering them every time. There's nothing you can do about this. And this was a spell that involved a, a cell phone as a magic wand and, and, a, and a redial. <laughs> In a speed dial there, because I did have her on my speed dial in case she had problems, especially after I heard about the boyfriend. So this weekend I get to come over. Uh, uh, he, he doesn't live in with her or anything. He's, 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 he's a biker dude, but he's not one of the better biker dudes you've ever met. I don't think he's from one of the better groups. Uh, uh, I didn't know them personally or anything. Just he's the things he talks about, you know. I have this mage thing that says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Things that most stand up in somebody's hearts, the things they talk about. You know, if I like my Mopars, you hear me talking about Mopars. You know, this guy's talking about hanging out with the boys and passing the bitches around and all this other kind of stuff. And some bitchy gone and sold for a carton of cigarettes and all this kind of thing. And all I can think is of a Tara. Is a what? Is Tara, the pattern, the girl. I'm over her house. I meet her boyfriend. So she steps out. She's got something. I can't remember what it was. It was in a bath. Something a neighbor gave her or something she had to take back to the house. So, so me and the boyfriend are kind of standing there in, the, in her house. It's not his house. It's her house. Actually, I'm standing near the kitchen counter near the telephone. You know, the telephone's on the, on the kitchen counter there. 
and I got her name and my speed dial. It just kind of occurs to me. This guy thinks he's going to end up passing her, you know, using her and passing around to her friends. He's looking at me. I'm dressed in black leather from head to toe, and he thinks I'm a badass biker dude. And it's kind of like, mm, kind of worse, really. Uh, 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 but um, I'm there in my pocket is my cell phone. Her name's on my speed dial. I'm figuring what will make him not want to do. He's not talking to me about doing that to her, but he's talking to me about doing that with all the bitches in the gang. So it's kind of like, I can't let her become part of the gang. She's a victim just hadn't right for it. And uh, so I speed dial her, her phone rings. She's gone. She's, she's out, out of earshot, out of the house, over to the, to the neighbor. She's going to be a few minutes. So he's standing there. He's looking at me. I'm standing near the phone. It's kind of like I reach over and I pick up the phone. And I answer it. It was me. But it's in my pocket. And I says, hello? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is her residence. No, I'm, I'm kind of her uncle. I wasn't. Uh, yeah, she, she said, whose office? Doctor. Oh, that doctor. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, and the tests are... Okay, yeah, she's going to want to hear that. Uh, no, I don't think she's gotten really involved with anybody yet, but this is, this is timely enough. We're, we're good. I'll let her know. I'll have her call you back when she gets back. Thank you, doctor. And I hung up the phone, and he's kind of looking at me like his eyes are going to crawl across the top of his head. His eyebrows are going to go like that. And I go, ah, it was nothing, just, a, just an exam. It was nothing. And, and you know I was lying, and it was like I made it look like I was lying. He thought I was lying. I just answered the phone, talked to a doctor, something about a test that you don't want anybody to get personal with or too close or sexual to be precise, you know. And he's about to pass him, you know, take her on and pass him around to his buddies, and it's kind of like... So when she comes back, he gives her a peck on the cheek and tells he's going to call her later. He never called her again, and... She felt kind of heartbroken for a while, and I tried to be a good friend as best I could and not feel too guilty. <laughs> yeah, you <laughs> scared him off with the, That's a psyop right there. Well, it always is. It always is. It's the way I always think and the way I always look. You know, you get out in the field, uh, uh, you're trying to get up on a guard. We used to have uh, Masashi, uh, not Masashi. Hatsumi, Dr. Hatsumi uh, had taught me what, uh, what we used to call the disappearing marble trick. All right. You, you got this little glass marble. We usually get them from paint cans and that. They're just little clear marbles. There's nothing on them other than the glass itself to draw light. All right. And usually if you kind of sandpaper a little, it's dull. It won't, it won't gleam. What it's used for, see, you kind of send out the sensation that somebody's watching. You give them their senses, if you can, every reason to confirm what they are feeling psychically or emotionally because you're generating this fear that they're mm -hmm. about to die but they can't rationalize it there it's a boring guard duty or something like that so if and i don't want them to look this way as i want to go that way so i take my little marble and i toss it it doesn't gleam it doesn't show up it doesn't make any noise until it hits the ground and then it clatters like glass and what's that noise? And they go over to, they're looking away from me. See, what you don't know or what you don't see, people say, what you don't know won't hurt you. No, that's exactly what will kill you. And that's the whole premise behind it. What you didn't know, you thought you heard something over there. You, 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 you know somebody's around, but you don't know where. You might be getting close to me. Bam, he's over there. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm here. <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah, what good did that do you? You see, it's... Uh, he, he showed us when he first started teaching us how to think about it. He'd say, you ever have this friend come up and they, back in the 50s and 60s, this was common hokey crap. And that kids would come up and tap you on one shoulder and duck to the other side, you know, and you'd look over and there's nobody there and he's there. And well, with the ninja, it's kind of like, all right, you buy time. Invisibility is being in the same room, affecting somebody's life without them being aware of you. It doesn't mean necessarily they have to see through you or that you look like a bush. They just have, you just have to be there affecting them without them being physically aware of you and where you're at and you know, being able to pinpoint you. You're harder to grab than smoke. You tap on the shoulder. 
They look, it is natural. You study the way their eyes move and their habits go. They look this way and they don't see you, of course. And then they'll look back over this way and see you, you know, but let's say instead you tap them here and you duck because they're going to look back at eye level. Now they got to look here, wrong, here, wrong. Here is where you are down there. See, the more you add to that, not being where they expect you to be, expect the unexpected, be the unexpected. You want to be invisible, be the unexpected. You want to be invincible, unstoppable, be the unexpected. You hit them while they're trying to hit you. They're not expecting to get hit. They got no defense for it. So if your life is on the line, it's split second accuracy. You know you can only make one punch. You might be able to get more, but one you can have for sure. Where are you going to put it? Put it right where you want it and right where it's going to do the most good so you don't have to hit them twice and move to the next and keep it going. You know, you got to, because I rarely, you know, only on the tournament floor do you get a one on one fight and get to fool around and have a good time. Out on the street, somebody like me, no one person ever attacks me. And if he's, there's more than one, they got weapons. And me, whether you see them or not, I'm always loaded. And if I'm in a neighborhood or a place that I frequent, I got weapons stashed there in odd places that somebody big like me can just reach up and you won't see. And, and I have it at my, you know, I will take a knife to a gunfight and you won't win. And I've been close enough. These were grazing shots where, yeah, yeah, you could, you know, but it's like you want to live or you want to die. If you don't try instantly, you guarantee you die. If you got that fight in you that, you know, I'm not necessarily going to lose. That's all you have to think. Not necessarily going to lose. And you put your best into it. You find yourself, I don't care who you are, uh, uh, that your boundaries are further than you thought. Uh, uh, that you're capable of more than you thought. And the more you refine that, the more you practice it in day to day so that it's comfortable with you. You know, if you have a weapon... Even if it's just a stick or a cane, if you're comfortable with that and you got the balance of that and it's just like a natural part of your body, it's kind of like it's beautiful. Keep it. I got I got this isn't the pen, but I got a pen that's this kind of this kind of steel that makes sure that no matter what, it's not going to crumble. If I want to cram it through your skull instead of through your eye socket, you know, the, 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 the optic nerve, I can do it or we'll put it through your throat to your spine or you know, but it's just a pen, and it's a real pen, but it's just kind of a steel body, or, or a very rigid body, you know, reinforced. Those are great. That's a great weapon right there. It, it, uh, I used to like, back in the 70s, I used to keep a few silver dollars in my pocket, too. Those were nice for up at close range. You got a handful of coins or something. You can do a handful of coins or one of those silver dollars. I can put it in, a, in an accurate place, you know, within 20, 30 feet, you know. Mm -hmm. Put that right between your eyes, good and hard, good snap to it. And it's like, oh, man, that will leave an impression on your skull. Believe me, people will know all. If you, if you can get up and walk away from it without being stunned, people will all in all the next couple of weeks, you got hit in the freaking forehead. <laughs> yeah, you have a big old dollars. scab on your forehead. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, sometimes you can stick them in, too. I've done that. Uh, uh, if, it, if it's something that's got just a little bit of a sharp edge, you whip that hard enough, you make it work. You put it where, where it's really going to do the most damage. It's going to hurt the worst. Hey, if you think it hurts you, think how it hurts the other guy. Because if you're not picking that fight, it's the other guy really needs it. For the benefit of your own community, you know, uh, 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 that's the way I look at it. I think about these guys pop out, they're going to jump me. I got to hurt whether they back off realizing who I am or how big I am or not. I got to trigger them because I don't know. My mother could be walking the next one or your mother. I don't care whose mother it is. Yeah. But you know, they're going to pick on the weak one. They're, they're going to do anything they want. And already they show they don't much have much concern. Whatever they're carrying as weapons or something like that. I want to break arms or legs, uh, usually arms and legs. Uh, uh, so and leave them. Hey, if the cops want them, fine. If they can get away and take care of that, fine. But they're like on probation. They don't vote. You ever see a guy on crutches go up and try to rob somebody? Good, good point. Good point. And people on crutches got to be polite, even to nerds. 
Mm-hmm. That's right. They really you, do. I'll pick that crutch out from under you. <laughs> yeah. mm-hmm. You know, you, you have to learn humility. I think that's better than the court system in probation. I, I, am I wrong? No, no, I mean, no. You're, you're, you're right everybody make that. up your own minds, you know. But Yeah, you take an ass whooping. That, yeah, that, that's going to show you some humility. And, and you know, the, the thing, another thing to take into consideration with that is, you know, a, a, a type of whatever person, man it is, that's going to dare to mess with a man like you or or a, even a man like me is a dangerous motherfucker because, I mean, you, you know. know you, you know, the first person to impress the hell out of me, I got to tell you about my first master, all right? He's a uh, Mohawk and Irish, more Mohawk than anything. He's from the Aquasesne Reservation up in northeast New York and in, uh, in Canada, Ontario there. Uh, he was like about maybe, he might have been like 5'2 in his cowboy boots, so you know I had heels on him. And, uh, I was six foot tall even when I was 12 years old, okay? Uh, I, we had never, I had met him when I was 10 though. But uh, uh, that's when I started my lessons with him. Now, he had give, his hobby was CB radios, and he had bought me a walkie-talkies for my birthday that year, 10, 10 years old. And, uh, and I'd call him, and after school I'd come over, and we'd talk on his bass station, and he'd help me with my homework sometime. And, and uh, then when he, you know, uh, one day I'm going over to his house, I got the walkie-talkies, and four well, only two came over at first. Two really huge black guys. I mean, these guys looked like they could have hung out with Tyson and looked right at home. All right. But I didn't know them from anywhere. It's like black people were not this, this neighborhood had a big mix of everybody. So, but these were strangers uh, 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 is the point I really want to make besides being really big. And, uh, and they wanted my walkie talkies. And it's kind of like, man, I was just scrawny little 10 year old. Here they go. Well, as it turned out, his name, we, we, uh, we call it John Little Fox, all right? It's not an Aquasessi name. He got the Little Fox from a Cherokee, actually. But uh, it's neither here nor there. But he used to be a commando back, and we didn't notice. My stepdad used to, used to tease him about being so short, all right? Uh, uh, you know, about m- maybe his older brother knocking on the door when his parents were trying to make him, and they never finished and stuff like that. You know, but he take it all in good humor in that. Well, here's these two guys. They got my walkie-talkies. And now look down the street, and here he comes, hell-bent for leather. He's like digging in in the freaking concrete, you know, coming up this way. And it's kind of like, what's he going to do? You know, these guys, you can see from down there, they're, they're huge. You know, I'm taller than him. They're much bigger than me. You know, and it's like, what are you thinking? <laughs> you know, I didn't know. He comes up, he does not stop, does not slow down. He drives both hands like this into their abdomens, lifts them up. My, my uh, grandfather used to run this little secondhand appliance shop he, that we were in front of when this happened, but it was closed that day. He jacks them up like that by their stomachs, up against the wall, off the ground. He's leaning into them like, at, like an angle like that. Just looking up at him, and in a in a low voice, quiet voice, he says, "You want to give the boy his walkie-talkies back?" <laughs> so they kind of he's they're twitching because he's really got him by a whole bunch of nerve bundles. But I didn't understand that back then. This is like 1963. The president got shot later that year. Nobody heard of Bruce Lee uh, or karate or anything, not like that. And uh, so anyway, he, he lets him down. By this time, two other guys, very much like them, come walking from across the street and, and, and say, you got a problem, white man? And John's standing there. He's in this kind of little crouch. His knees are bent. I'm noticing kind of, he's standing kind of loose. And he looks over their shoulder and he says, who are you calling a white man? And, and uh, me, I figure we're going to die. So I, I just know we're going to die. This is going to be a bad ending. And I kind of shut my eyes and I cock my fist and maybe I'll hit one as he's tearing my arms off or something. It's all the confidence I had. And in the time I close my eyes and cock my fist, I hear this. Pat, 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 and pat, 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 pat. A lot of dull thuds. Just instantly. And I crack my eyes open and he's still standing in front of me with his back to me. 
And he's in this kind of crouch, this springy kind of, like a Billy Jack kind of crouch. And, uh, and there's like, the snowbanks are littered with very large, ominous black men with scars and tattoos. And, and, and he's just this five foot nothing. And he takes me home and he's going to talk to my grandmother about teaching me how to fight. And I'm going, like that? And I didn't even see that. Uh, you know, it's like, wow. And he says, well, you got to do exactly as I tell you. And all. you're not going to be a bully, are you? And no. But he says, if I tell you to smash through a brick, you you do it with all your might. And, well, maybe I might be a little bit better off not just getting beat up a little, you know. <laughs> you know, at that point, and he says, do you think I'd make you do it if I didn't think you could do it and, and, and teach you how and why first? You know, and, and he did all of that. But that was a little five foot nothing guy that that those guys picked on and they were no match for him. For me later, I'm stronger and faster than he was. As I got older, I got a lot stronger and faster than he was. At, uh, uh, but uh, he was the one that, that uh, did those gave me a lot of life skills. Did, did they end up on the ground? Oh, definitely on the ground and broken. Those boys weren't going to hurt anybody anytime soon. They were not capable of p taking on a fight. They were crippled. Uh, so what, he, he put two of them on the ground or what? Four of them. Damn. Four of them. Quickly, very quickly. Well, I learned later how, but at that time, that was freaking magic. I mean, and, and I was a witch. <laughs> you know, I was like, oh, I got to learn that. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. That was that was a, a demonstration, almost like you know, spiritual type of you know, oh, indoctrination. It, it was. It was like just the man I need to know. You know, life is tough. I'm getting all these thrown by. If I could do that, I could overcome a lot more things than I have been. And that was his idea too. And uh, and he helped me explore a lot of other things uh, like astral projection and things, being able to do it more on purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, he did more with me from remote viewing and then when I got turned over at ninth grade to the National Reading Institute and we start doing the project talent and search deals for the remote viewing, uh, finding Soviet moles and stuff like that uh, here in America. Fascinating. And I think that that could probably be a whole subject for a whole uh, episode right there because the, the subject we had for this one and I think we've actually we've been going almost three hours now. But the, the, we this yep. thing is chocked full of information, and but it, there's there's a lot there's several aspects. You know, we look just found out about the cure, cancer cures and also the the good aspects of cannabis. But then there was also a lot of uh, uh, tactical, um, just yeah. a lot of martial in, information. You know that it, that's a great subject. Yeah, you know? there, there's yeah when you see a survivor or a veteran who comes home and he's still got all his limbs and he still looks somewhat formidable. You have to realize that there are reasons, probably many reasons, why and how they came home that way. It wasn't just accidental. And a lot of times they're burying the scars of seeing friends they thought were even better than them get a little crap blown right out of them beside themselves. This is the part where Memorial Days and Veterans Days gets to be really hard for me to take. They start putting down, he died for our freedom. You got less now than anybody ever had before he was born. Uh, and, and don't blame the kid for it or the soldier for it. It's just we just got conditioned and used and sent out to the freaking slaughter. And the elite just kind of wipe their chin and continue on. You know, let's make more gold. Let's make more misery and then make more gold trying to cure the misery or claiming we're curing the misery. And when they're making the misery, like I said, my particular cancer, I'm not really meant to survive. Whether I do or not, well doesn't matter so much as what I do with the time that I have as I have it. Well, right? I, I, what else, two years from now or a year from now, it's what I do today. Right. Well, I tell you, I tell you what, in my opinion, the, let you, the, the last three hours you've spent have been well invested, you know, and all that, you know, oh, in, in service think, to humanity. I believe so. I believe so. when you begin to recognize, even if you don't believe me, when you recognize the, MO, the method of operation, the tactics, the kind of things they do. It's like a fingerprint. It tells you who did it, you know, who was responsible, who's behind it. 
you know, the, the more I say, the, 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 the more I can reveal the, the, the tactics, the ways, the more you understand where to look for your enemy hiding. You know, when you hear that little clatter, you, you suspect he might be over there and you hear a clatter of glass on the floor over there. Don't give that much more than a glance. Finish checking there. You right. hit a nerve, you got close. When you see somebody get on the air or you, or you say something and you, you get a threat right off the bat, you know you hit a nerve. Don't pull your hand away. Stay on the nerve. Uh, 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 you, th that you know for sure. You got the soft spot. Don't let go of it because the next time you hit, it's going to be chinks. It's like them. When these politicians and that come up and they pat you on the back, it's not to reward you for doing a good job. It's to feel for the soft spot to stick the knife later. Yes, it is. Right? It, it so really if you're is. a spook or a counter spook, you got to think twice and outthink them. Don't be where they expect you to be or make it look like you're somewhere or something you're not. The more disinformation they have, the harder it is to pinpoint you. That, um, that's right. And even the, even our listeners and everything who might even uh, be a little old lady living on the corners, it, she's getting philosophies and learning things right now about how, you know, how to not be a victim. Right, right. All of these things, it doesn't matter if you're six foot five and able to flip somebody's SUV over, you know, you're 90 pounds and 90 years old, but you got a head that works, you know, your marble bag's still there and it doesn't have a hole in it, and, it, but, and, and you still retain stuff, you know things, and it's kind of like, you know, get a hold of yourself. You can do that by, by, by regulating your breathing, you know, slowing and deepen it. When you get scared, you start taking these shallow breaths, and it becomes harder for you to think, not quicker. So if you stop, you, you see something kind of scary. Slow down a minute. Just kind of straighten your spine a little bit. Don't straighten it rigid, but, you know, your shoulders back a little bit. Inhale deeply. Bring it down into the abdomen. Express your abdomen. Your abdomen expands further than your rib cage does for your lungs. So you get about 33% more air, oxygen. This Races through your blood system, keeps your muscles working fast, your brain working even faster. And as you, and when the adrenaline kicks in, now it's kicking in with somebody who's thinking, not freaking the fuck out or spazzing or anything else because the shallow breaths, shallow oxygen up here, things working, things misfiring, just making you more vulnerable. All right. The ultra, we're not vulnerable. <laughs> it's kind of like even when you hit us, we're going to recover very, very fast. So mm -hmm. it has to be, I think if you really want to take, I think you're going to have to take my freaking head off or something. It has to be something that there's no way that, you know, there's no heart or lungs or brain to recover with or something. Mm -hmm. it's, it's Nothing else has, has ever worked. And even the, the poisons and stuff they did and, and I, like I said, I believe the leukemia came to me the same way it did to Lloyd Pye and Dr. Carla Turner. And, you, you know, given the circumstances, the pattern recognition, at the pattern's the same. These people are not imaginative nor creative. You know, they take the same program, different name, different city, but the same program. Mm -hmm. That's right. And they, It they, works. Yeah, and let me tell you that I guarantee you they didn't expect you to, uh, you know, be uh, looking this good right now today, and then not only that, disseminating more information so that we get to know inside, we get to view inside the mind of the enemy. You know what I mean? We're, we're yeah. see, we I see their up, tactics. Yeah, I woke up out of that coma, and on top of the diabetic coma, you have acute leukemia. You're ravaged with it. And, and you, you know, we had to start your chemo while you were in the coma. It's that bad. It's got, where the hell did I suddenly catch cancer? Yeah, I, you know the, the how world. that actually I know exactly how that happened. I have documented it, and and like any doctor or medical panel has to admit it's right because that's where I got the information from. At uh, you know when I tried to discover how it is that that Ply and 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 Doctor Turner ended up suddenly catching cancer, you know nobody else in their family's got it, but they got this really severe nothing you can do about. Even though you got friends that donate millions to, to, to get you the best treatments, pipe, they didn't pull through. Well, where, where did they get it from? Did, you said you know, you know the source of it? or No, 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 no. I asked, I asked a panel of doctors. I had a, a friend I was starting. You know, I was already diabetic, and you know, I had a friend that's a doctor. I worked in a hospital, 
And uh, he gave me his password for the medical panel. So when Pi and Turner died the same way, the same virulency, basically I used his password, posing as him, with the medical panel, and told him that I was researching you know, on this particular topic. And that, is it possible that anyone could be inflicted or catch cancer? And it came back unanimous. It was like, you're, you know, you, 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 they must have figured I was not the brightest one in my medical school because they says any pathogen, when extraordinary measures, measures are taken to introduce it into the body of the victim, is a, a transmittable disease. You, know, you, you, you can catch. So having said that, now I had already at that time a, a spook friend of our team had warned me that some of my insulin bottles were tainted with snake venom. So I knew about that, and it's kind of like if they took, let's say, let's say we're both the same blood type, okay? Maybe we're, you know, you know, same blood type, but you got a virulent brain cancer, all right? But they can get a little biopsy of them, you know, and, hey, wow, yeah, these cells are malignant. And they can take those cells, and they can put them into a, a thing of insulin or a flu shot, and inject it into your body, and then guess what? I got exactly the same cancer you got at about the same stage, or it's going to get there really, really fast. That's what happened to Lloyd Pye. You can check, like I say, this is pattern recognition, and then the doctor saying this, it says it's doable. So how do you think it was done? And I'd have to be a simple doctor not to have been aware of that. So how do you think it was done? You know, it's Occam's razor. The simplest so solution is the right one. That uh, those two non-cancer families necessarily, you know, they eat well, they take care of themselves, all of a sudden coming down with a very virulent, uncurable form of cancer. What do they have in common? Both of them are the most, some of the most convincing people. I mean, they don't, they don't stand there. You see how passionate I am now. They're calmly and they got the facts, the figures, all that stuff. The slides prepared and everything. They're very, very calm and professional about it. And it's kind of like when you look, even if you come in a skeptic, I had been with Pi on a few things, but uh, what he showed me was what I seen was, you know, it's there, it's true. Is it how, how it applies? Kind of anybody's guess. That's speculation. But the fact is what he showed was the facts. What we've been told has been all lies. And... Every bit when, of it. Every bit, right. bit now, of it. Now, if I told you, uh, if I gave you bad information and sent you out on a battlefield or into a critical situation with bad information, you know, no matter how smart, how wise, how clever, how good at your job you are, what do you think your odds are of actually accomplishing that job? And we're not even talking about you know, assassins or, 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 you know, bullets flying or anything like that. I don't care if you're going out into the business world or something. Somebody gives you the wrong information at the right time and you're ruined. Or you're successful. All right? Bad information is going to poison you. Good information is going to get you the leg up. It's going to be that little edge that you got, like the gunslinger with your back to the sun you know, any little thing that you can shave a second off of this showdown to make sure you can talk about it tomorrow, you do. Uh, you know, this is this is this is where and how you do it. This is the frame of mind you got to you practice. I had to grow up in, or I wouldn't be here. All right, uh, and then they had me teach others, which was good. Some of them got it, and they lived. Some of them didn't. The point they forgot or became unaware became recorded as their time of death, especially for those of us that they're working regularly. Uh, uh, those of you that, well, they were part of the program for a while, they were trying this or that, or they're still measuring the effects of something they did to try to tweak somebody else. You may not be an active working agent, but there could be no active working agent without what they learn from you. Right. All the empirical data. And it doesn't matter if you go now, especially with all this stuff, uh, it doesn't matter if you go to an ultra clinic or your own regular family doctor, because as soon as it goes into the computer, your medical record, in spite of the HIPAA, the feds know everything. 
So all the empirical data they should want from the tests of the stuff they did to you, they can get from your doctor without anybody knowing. They got it all. Every time you get a blood test, they know what it is. That, uh, and they keep people like that. My friend Devin Mitch, uh, uh, Deb in particular has that. Melissa has a bit of that. She's a, she's a lot less uh, uh, cooperative, but uh, uh, with with them about it, uh, any place you can try to throw a wrench in the work. Something that you know, garbage in, garbage out. You, you know, you, even if your address is wrong, let them go looking at the wrong place. That right. gives you a few minutes. Gives you a few minutes leeway. Oh, that's the house next door. Hey, why is the cops busting on the house next door? Because it's time for me to leave. Or hide. Or grab weapons or whatever it is. I have my warning. Mm -hmm. Do I have to have a multi-million dollar electronic surveillance thing? There's all kinds of things I've learned my whole life for this low tech for for you know for finding out and, and, and always having that little kind of like a spider on the web, because that's how they think. You, you got your, your web lines out everywhere, and you got your feet on the different lines. And as soon as there's a little twang, you know, on this one, you know where your prey is without seeing it. Mm-hmm. That's what they do. That's what I do to keep them from doing what they do to me. <laughs> yeah, turn it around on them. Turn it around All on the time, them. Every time, and, and then some things that I've learned, you know. Uh, make it very weird. They do not mess with me unless they absolutely, I mean, like it's critical or something. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, and I don't give them that. Um, you know, always stop about so far, go so far, then you know, further on a little bit more. And it's like, you know, nobody wants to come because you're guaranteed, you know, somebody, a, a number of people is going to die besides me, even if you're really good. That uh, somebody's going to die. This guy, well, do you want to be you? Who wants right. to be? I've done it in gang fights. It's like after you peg somebody really, really bad, really fast, the rest of them are kind of stop. You know, next. Uh, uh, um, or if I wanted to, in the case of the guys I was talking about before, it's like they were wanting to back away, but I couldn't let them back away because they're going to just wait for the next person. So I made a couple really insulting racial epithets. <laughs> yeah, it's like coming from a tall white guy, so I was really going to hurt. At uh, 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 you know, one they they, they they decided that was maybe too big to take on, but I turn around and it's like, you nigglets got any plans for me? And it's like, nigglet. And I said, well, you're not face it, you're not big enough to be a full grown one. And that oh, see, when you drive a man to anger. And you, you get a rage, you take away his greatest weapon, his ability to think clearly. Mm-hmm. All right? Absolutely. So they start swinging. I get my fight. I break them. Arms, you know, at least an arm and a leg on each. They're not going to do this tomorrow or the next day or next week. He's gonna, they, they got crazy ass, you know, cast that kind of hold your arm up like this at an angle and that. They're not bothering anybody. They have to choose a whole new line of work and a whole new, during this time of recuperation, have to rethink their approach for everybody now because they're not half so tough as they were before this happened now. That's right. They, their whole worldview can change. Yeah, and that was part of my command. Surprisingly, I didn't kill more people on the streets of Rochester. Uh, uh, n- not many at all because... It's like never affect a permanent solution for a temporary problem. Right. And what's a good temporary fix? You break them. They can't drive the car. They can't race it, can they? Right. They can't. <laughs> it ain't got no damn wheels. He's not going to race. He's not going to squeal his tires, is he? Right. They can't victimize women and, and <coughs> beat up kids and stuff like that. There's, there's always a cure for everything. If you stop and you think it out, what are they doing and what do they need to make this happen and take it away from them before they can grab it. But when you look for the patterns and you're thinking of it before, that while they're thinking of it, before they do it, by the time they're doing it, it's like you can watch it happening in their eyes and just, and they wonder how you're there for them. Like that last fool swinging that kick up like he was going to kick me upside my head. And all I did was snatch and raise my hand up like that, because that's a lot higher than his leg reaches. Mm-hmm. The next thing you know, his head's hitting the concrete, huh? Bingo. 
Oh, Bingo. That's something else. It's like, that's all it took. And it's like, okay, smart ass, rethink this. Mm -hmm. And, you there know, you they, they lived, they're broken a little bit, but kind of aren't we all. And they don't get to break any other people. And now they have more. If they didn't have before the empathy, they'll have a little bit more now because they've been there themselves. Yeah. And, and they, or they got respect for knowing that there's other, you know, people out there like they are. Or, yeah. or, you know, or, or even stronger. John, right. let me tell they, you, it's, uh, it's been a, this, this has been an exceptionally good uh, episode. I, I think we'll at least, at least get about three or four good. Oh, wow. Yeah, you're right. It is three hours. Yeah. Wow. I did. The time flew. Honestly, I didn't see three hours go by. Well, I know. Me neither. Because we, we got a bunch of, we got, got a good information, though, on this yeah. one. I think the viewers are really going to like it. Yeah. And so let's be in contact uh, off list. So we can, uh, you and I can discuss the, what our topic will be on the next talk. Sure. Anytime. That sounds yeah, great. Actually, you can hit it with, with me cold. It's kind of like if I've been there, I lived there, I can tell you all about it, what made it work, what would have made it fail. i just been there. That's, right. Yeah. You, yeah. Okay, I will. I'll, I'll think, you know, because I've got a wealth of information based on, you know, your experiences, and I'll yeah. come up with a topic. And, and yeah, because I think it did real yeah. good. We we got it down to these topics, you know, and that's good. Yeah, if somebody feels they need a little more information or validation at one point or another, ask. Okay, okay. and and then can they, if they do feel like they need some more information, can they reach out to you on Facebook or some some? Oh like yeah, that? oh yeah, yeah. I, I I pretty much accept anybody on Facebook because when I got on there, I was an author and and people were writing to me from all over the world. So I was like, I don't know this guy from Adam. But, you know, he puts in for, and I do the radio shows, so, and some of them are on actually FM stations and stuff, so people here that aren't on the internet don't know me from the internet, and it's kind of, okay, Facebook is real easy to get to, I'll accept you right off, you start acting like a shill or something like that, like the fool that says, well, he said he was 55, he was too young for Nam, and it's kind of, didn't you listen to this, you know, okay, uh, in those days, it's like, it's quick, to, it's easy to block them. You know, it's just a click of the thing, and it's kind of like, all right, I, I'll let you in. I'd rather block you if you act up or keep you if you're good. It's mm -hmm. kind of like, uh, sometimes those work out very, very nice. Mm -hmm. I like, or actually, most of the time. I got yeah. a little over 2,100 friends now. Oh, that, uh, that's a good, that's a good yeah, uh, audience that's right makes, there. Yeah, so, you know, so that's a good thing. You say something, people hear it, they talk to their friends. Uh, uh, it's funny now, I get people, that when, when a false flag happens, they start calling the shots right from their own PC before I ever say anything and start talking about exactly what's wrong with it. And it's like they learned, they got it, they're watching, they're getting it. Mm -hmm. It's like you can't ask for more than that. Hey, if I only got another day or two of life left, and I believe I got more than that, honestly. Oh, yeah. But that's all I had. I just keep this because how many lambs, and I know some are getting snatched right out of the lion's mouth, right from between his teeth. Because we gave them good information, that's and it's worth it. That's right. And on, on these episodes here, I'm going to put the link to your book. Oh yeah, there's bookricks.com. Yeah, they're all free, so it's kind of like you can re read and browse to your heart's content. You can download it. Uh, you can reprint my pictures on Facebook. There is literally a dozen different albums with multiple hundreds of pictures of all kinds of things that we do: witchy stuff, ninja stuff. Uh, paranormal, you know, uh, you can check it. You can even reprint it. Yeah, there you yeah. go. There you heard it right there. Royalty free right, right. there. Yeah, right. Royalty free. Uh, my book, Practical Witchery, you can print it out on your printer and hard bound it and keep it in your library. You just can't sell copies of it. Right, but of course. Yourself, you can do anything. You, you have my explicit permission. It's got my name on it. It's public. It's free. It's out there to 